so again, good evening, everyone. I'm Max Nospish, Manager of Visitor Experiences at the First Amendment Museum. Thank you all for joining us for Brown Belongings, a dialogue about the politics of color and class. This is your first time joining the First Amendment Museum for our online speaker series. We are a fiercely nonpartisan museum in Augusta, Maine, dedicated to promoting the understanding and use of the First Amendment so that all may reap the benefits. Um, and as a nonprofit, we rely on generous donations from viewers like you all. So I hope you consider donating to us today. Um, so thank you for that. And this evening, we are hosting California artist, Linda Vallejo, who will be discussing her most recent solo exhibition, Brown Belongings, an exhibit that visualizes and reimagines what it means to be a person of color in the United States. Brown Belongings recalls the experiences, knowledge, and feelings Vallejo has gathered over more than four decades of her study of Latino, Chicano, and American indigenous culture and communities. Through her work, Vallejo manifests the unique power of art, one of her most powerful forms of speech and expression, to make poignant statements about our society. Using art to promote social justice and change is the essence of what the First Amendment is all about. She's an accomplished artist whose work has been exhibited throughout the country. Her work has been featured in the Museum of Latin American History, Texas A&M University's Reynolds Gallery, the Lancaster Museum of Art and History, the University Art Gallery of New Mexico State University, and in many more places beyond that. Her work is also part of the permanent collections of the Museum of Sonoma County, California, the Museo del Barrio in New York City, the Carnegie Art Museum, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, Arizona State University and more. Uh, and I know that was, uh, Linda, I know that was a very, very condensed version of all the places your art has been displayed and shows. I had to kind of just a little bit, but it was so much more. So after Vallejo's presentation tonight, uh, join us for a live Q&A where you, the audience, will have the opportunity to ask any questions you might have for our speaker. Um, please post questions for Linda in the chat. Uh, we hope to see you guys then. And without further ado, Linda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Maxwell. Thank you, Christian. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm very happy to be uh, invited by the museum to present my work. I'm very proud to be a Mexican American who is able to share my thoughts and feelings about being an American um, through my artwork, being a brown American through my artwork. So with no further ado, I'm going to share my screen and begin my slideshow. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about a very recent portfolio, a series of portfolios that started in 2010, uh, The Objects of Opulence, which are a dialogue about, the appro about appropriation and the politics of privilege, Make Them All Mexican, which is a dialogue about appropriation and the politics of color and class, and The Brown Dot Project and Datos Sagrados, which is an excellent solution or an elegant solution to complex questions about Latino data in the United States. Just to step back for a moment and answer Maxwell's question, I started painting when I was four years old and I've been an artist all my life. I, don't, I can't imagine another way to live, to think creatively, to work with media, uh, to uh, share my ideas and my thoughts. I do a lot of reading and a lot of studying and collecting a lot of data these days. It's always been a part of my life and I enjoy being an artist more than anything other than being um, a wife, a mother, and a grandmother. Okay, I'm having more difficulty, there we go. So we have the Objects of Opulence 2022. And this is the first image I'd like you to look at. It's my newest installation. And it is based on Victorian wealth, the wealth uh, that existed in the United States uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries that built the United States, the power and the money that was that made the new America and the nouveau riche. And I asked myself the question, where were Latin Americans then? Where were African Americans then? Where were the Irish? Where were the Jewish? Where was the Jewish nation? And I found that we're all basically in the same place. We were the workers, the backbone that made the United States the great country that it is today. So I appropriate actual objects, Victorian objects, and I paint them brown and place them in a background of mm. polka dots uh, with all the accoutrement of royalty, of the objects of opulence. These are um, uh, bouquets, uh, beautiful brown bouquets that are a part of 
of the objects of opulence that are placed in these environments that I'm creating that include mm -hmm. objects and um, all in the color of milk chocolate. Mm -hmm. uh, you might ask yourself why milk chocolate? Uh, because it seems to be the least egregious color of brown inside and outside of the community. Milk chocolate is delicious, it's addictive, it's sweet, and that's mm -hmm. how we like to see ourselves. This particular object is a data-based object, Objects of Opulence. It indicates the data that between 2010 mm -hmm. and 2015, Latino college students uh, graduated, graduations grew by 48.6%. Mm -hmm. You can see the tattoo painted mm -hmm. on the back of this uh, Grecian style figure that is also painted brown. There's 31 spaces. I multiplied that by 40.6% and I painted 13 spaces. So, mm -hmm. The data itself is embedded in the tattoo and signifies a specific data that graduates grew by 40.6% between 2010 and 2015. So in this case, once again, I've appropriated mm -hmm. an image of culture, uh, history and painted it brown. This is also a database piece. It has another database, Datos Sagrados or uh, data pictograph on the seat. It's a children's uh, Victorian chair. And it signifies the data that 27.3% of COVID-19 deaths were Latino as reported by the US CDC in April of 2020, that was a weighted distribution. In this particular case, I draw the mandalic form on 160 spaces times 0.273 for 160 painted spaces painted, which signify this particular set of data 27.3. So I've managed to cross history with contemporary data by including data pictographs on a variety of items. Um, objects of opulence also includes um, incongruous popular images, such as this giant Coca-Cola bottle, which is called It's the Real Thing. Uh, Hispanics will fill 75% of new US jobs between 2020 and 2034. Uh, this is a repurposed vintage glass with enamel, acrylic, wood, and it's about 28 inches tall. And what I did was I, I, um, I, I presupposed that the bottle represented 100%. So I filled it with 70, 750, uh, uh, 75, I'm sorry, 75 wooden balls painted chocolate to signify the 75% that the new jobs will be filled by Latinos uh, between now and 2034. This is another data piece, which is a pop piece that fills uh, a part of the uh, uh, objects of opulence. And this, this piece is called, you can have your cake and eat it too. 36% of UC entrants were Latino in 2020, which is a new, it breaks a new record. Once again, I, do, I drew a formula on the top of the cake after, this is a cake made out of paper, by the way, and those are fake chocolate cherries or fake cherries. There are 58 drawn spaces on the top of the cake times 46%, uh, 36%, excuse me, is 21 uh, brown painted spaces equal and signify that data. So I'm incorporating data with Victorian history, with the idea of a conversation beginning a dialogue about the politics of prestige or privilege. Uh, before this, I was doing a series called Make Them All Mexican between 2010 and 2022. And this first image I'm gonna show you is I, I would go to antique stores and antique malls and buy pricey antiques and paint them brown. In this case, you have Little Boy Brown celebrating El Dia de los Muertos. So I basically painted Little Boy Brown brown, <laughs> Little Boy Blue brown and made him brown. And then I gave him a half face calaca, which is uh, indicative of the Day of the Dead celebration. By the way, I gather most of my data from either uh, US government sources or from the Pew Charitable Trust Latino Initiative. This next piece is from the Make Em All Mexican is the Three Graces. And you can see that the girls are all uh, different shades of brown. And I gave them tattoos to uh, bring the image into the, the present time. This again is appropriating culture, appropriating history, giving it to the to us to the Latin Americans of the United States. Uh, this is uh, La Victoria, it's of course a very famous um, victory, and it's painted with car paint and uh, detailed, as you can see in the bottom, pinstriped detailed at the bottom. It's about forty inches tall, and uh, 
well, let's say it's give, it gives a victory to the Latin American people of the United States. It gives victory back to them, if you will. Uh, this is Superman. He's about 26 inches tall. Once again, this piece is um, car painted with a milk chocolate and a flake. I presented this piece to an individual um, that uh, at, a, at a, a lecture that I was giving, it was a large group of people and a, a, a young man was, stood up. He, was, he looked like he'd just been to church. He had a coat and tie on. He was very presentable, very lovely young man and his wife. And he, uh, with a trembling lip, said to me, Linda, thank you so much for making Superman Brown, because now I can imagine that I too could be the hero of my city, that I too could be the hero of the country, that I could save people, and that I could be seen as a valuable member of my community and of the world. The coinciding portfolio, it's been brown now for 12 years, is the Brown Dot Project in Datos Sagrados, which I started in 2015 and is going to 2022. And you can see me actually dotting these objects. I show this slide because that way you can see that they're not uh, computer generated, but actually hand painted. I paint 50 dots at a time and make a hash mark. In this particular case, the image is 24 by 24 inches. And in that area of architectural grid vellum, gridded vellum, there are 48,400 squares. At that time in 2015, Los Angeles County was 48.3% Latino. So when you multiply 48,400 by 48.3%, you end up with 23,377. So this particular piece contained 23,377 dots to signify that data. So I call these data pictographs and I've been making data pictographs for quite some time. This is a data pictograph of New York in 2015, which at that time was 27.5% Latino. In this case, there was 82,944 squares time 27, 0.5% equal 22,800 dots, 810 dots. And these are all done by hand. And you can see the skyline at the bottom. You can see the skyline of New York at the bottom, which I was very pleased with. It's a very large piece, 36 inches by 36 inches. It took about a week to date, to date, to create the data and to dot this particular piece. This is also Los Angeles at 48.3%. This is uh, Miami at 66%, uh, 54,743 dots. <clears throat> These are really large heads that are done in the same fashion on architectural grid paper, uh, using brown dots to signify data, uh, really uh, large portraits. These are antique postcards that I collect and I created a grid myself by literally drawing squares, you know, drawing the squares on a printed out, a enlarged uh, print of the postcard. And then if you will allow me, uh, whited them out. Uh, this particular uh, piece at, from the Memories of Mexico, 75% uh, of immigrants are lawful. 75.5% of immigrants in the United States are lawful. There's 340 spaces and 257 painted spaces. Some of the data is uh, really good and some of the data isn't so good, but it's very important that people understand who the US Latino is and that we understand who we are as well. This is another of the postcards and this one signifies that 43.3% of farmers in the United States were Latino in 2015. I try to pick postcards, uh, many of the postcards from the 19, the early 20th century were a very, uh, very, very extremely poor Mexicanos. Um, I'm not sure why they wanted to show photographs of, of the poverty at that in that level rather than showing images of people in, in their family and in, in finery. So I try to choose postcards as this one, which shows, a, which shows a very humble family, but a family unit where you see the children and the mother and the father all together in front of their house. This is another series of data pieces. This is 91.2% of Los Angeles East Side is Latino. It's no surprise there. Uh, this is actually a repurposed photograph taken from the internet of one of the adobes. And I do a square onto this on, I, well, I put a grid on it first. I manipulated it to create a grid. And then I 
drew a box on top of that and then dotted that box. You can see the top center, 100, uh, 1,521 squares, 1,387 dots to signify the fact that East Los Angeles is pretty much almost 100% Latino. These are two additionals. The bottom one uh, signifies the fact that 35% of US Latinos voted for Trump. 4,675 squares, 6,000, sorry, that must be 3,636 brown dots, excuse the typo. These are done on hand-created uh, gridded paper and uh, photographs that I've taken uh, from the internet. Here we have two more brown dot objects. And this last, the bottom one says that 23.9% of sex trafficking in the United States was Latino in 2015. I thought it would be higher, which I thought was interesting. And it made me wonder where is the, where is the larger group of sex trafficking? Where are the next, uh, the largest group of sex trafficking victims? What, what uh, nationality do they represent? And, um, I believe it must be Asian, but I haven't done that data. Understanding data and using data to be able to understand ourselves and to be able to share ourselves with others, I think is a very important thing to do rather than just relying on urban myth or on um, you know, news that may or may not be real. I think it's really important to do the study and uh, look at the data. And I try to create images that share the data in beautiful ways. These are more data-based works called Datos Sagrados. 53% uh, of US Latinos live in 15 metropolitan areas, which we can probably decide as New York, Miami, uh, anywhere in Texas, uh, California, uh, Denver, Chicago, for sure. This one, I draw out the mandalic form, I count the number of spaces, and then I paint the appropriate number brown. In this case, there's 116 drawn spaces times 63 or 53%. This is another Data Sagrados, which again, 43.3% of US farming, forestry and fishery workers are Latino. And uh, I didn't put the numbers of the exact uh, uh, number of spaces and dots, but if there were a hundred on this particular uh, image, then again, there would be 43 spaces painted brown. This is my last show that Maxwell was nice enough to mention, Brown Belongings, that was at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes in Los Angeles. It contained 125 works and came with a full color catalog with 100 images and four uh, critical essays, scholarly essays. This was an exhibition that I had at the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach in 2018 that uh, featured several of the Datos Sagrados so that you can see how they look on the wall, kind of like snowflakes on the back of the wall. Um, they kind of look like a sort of like a planetary uh, a constellation. Uh, this was one of my favorites. It was at the, the Texas A&M Reynolds Gallery. Uh, it was a student uh, curated exhibition in a beautiful space. And I had a wonderful time with the students there and the administrators there. It was, it was a beautiful event and it was a pleasure to work with the students at Texas A&M. This was the cover of Artillery Magazine. I'm, Always um, very grateful to my colleague, Tulsa Kenny for uh, providing this opportunity for me. This is Fred and Barney, 2012. And uh, you can see that Fred's a little lighter than Barney. Barney's a little shorter. He looks kind of like a Guatemalteco, rather short, dark Latin American. And yet I did this this way because, you know, Barney is one of the best friends in the world. He is, uh, loyal to Fred, even though Fred creates all these messes for him. No matter what happens, Barney always forgives him and comes back. So the idea is, you know, even a, a shorter and dark individual could be one of the best friends you could ever have. I was very fortunate to be included on the front page of the Los Angeles uh, Times for another series that I did called the Brown Oscars with the good help of my colleague, Sean Noriega and the Chicano Studies Research Center at UCLA. Um, I basically stole images of different um, famous movie stars and printed out their pictures and painted them brown and wrote an article about the uh, lack of Latino representation in the Oscars. Uh, if you can remember, there was really quite a lot of talk about that lack of uh, representation of people of color 
on the on on the board as well as in the um, the awardees. I was in the uh, LA Times uh, for my exhibition at uh, the LA, LA Plaza de Cultura y Artes. Uh, I was very pleased to be have the work uh, covered. And I was also in the New York Times for that as well. I'm sorry, it was New York first and now it's Los Angeles time with Matt Stromberg. And this was my solo in New York at the Soto Clemente Velas Art and Cultural Center in 2014. And you can see many of the Make Em All Mexican objects in this particular piece, along with some of the movie stars. And there is Superman also. And so I thank you for allowing me to share this work and I'm looking forward to all your questions and to talk a little bit with, more with Maxwell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. My pleasure. Um, so um, I just want to go back to my original question. And before I, I get started, I will say anybody who is watching um, on Zoom or on Facebook, please, if you have any questions for Linda, please put them in the chat. We love having questions from our audience and um, I'll include those into this Q&A. Again, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So feel free to um, add your own comments, thoughts, questions, that sort of thing. Um, so Linda, I asked you this earlier, um, but I want to ask you again. So can you tell us a little bit maybe about your early years, your upbringing, and how you got to be an artist, how you got to where you are now? Well, my father was a retired colonel in the Air Force, and uh, graduated from UCLA in 1981 as a Mexican-American at UCLA. And then we moved to Germany. And so I was always very much uh, aware of all different types of cultures and appreciating many cultures in my life. Um, we moved back to the United States and I traveled a great deal through many states and lived in many states with my father and my mother and my brother and my sister. And I ended up in middle school and high school in Montgomery, Alabama in the mid sixties. I was there during some of the worst times, I believe, uh, the Selma marches, um, the lynchings and the burning crosses. And it was at that time that I really realized that uh, I was a person of color. It never dawned on me before that. I was surrounded by people of all races, creeds and colors all over the world. And I just saw myself as a human being and either a good one or not a good one, right? And then when I was in Alabama, suddenly I said, oh my goodness, there's a difference. And People don't like the differences sometimes. People are uncomfortable with the differences and there's violence surrounding the differences. Then after I was in Alabama, I went to Madrid, Spain and went to some more, high, I went to high school actually there. For, first I finished high school there and then did some college there and uh, really enjoyed Europe a great deal the second time. And I've always loved ancient cultures and I've always loved traditional cultures a great deal. When I came back to the United States to go to, uh, to get my MFA at Cal State University Long Beach and to be in LA closer to my family, I found uh, Chicano culture. I started a job with Self-Help Graphics and Art Incorporated with Sister Karen Bocaletto, uh, teaching children in East LA. And I spoke Spanish by that time because I had been in Spain. And I began to study my own culture and understand even greater about Indigenous America, Latinx, Chicanx, all of these things that I now have as a part of my brown intellectual property. So I've spent a, a lifetime really traveling a great deal, seeing most of, many of the major museums of the world, painting since I was a small child, um, working in the art departments in high school, college and graduate school, and slowly but surely found my way. Um, I was painting a great deal for many years and I was traveling uh, throughout the United States to do some teaching for about a, let's say like about a six year period, I was bouncing all over the place teaching. And I saw many pieces that were based on uh, what they call, uh, at that time they called it post-production, which is now called repurposed or appropriation, where you collect objects that are already made and put them together to create a new object. And I asked myself one day, uh, I wonder if I made re objects from repurposed materials, 
uh, from my cultural point of view, what would that look like? And it took four years to actually coagulate that idea and to come up with something. And it happened in a, a secondhand store, an antique mall, where I found the primer of Dick and Jane. And anyone who's grew up in the 50s knows the Dick and Jane primers. Uh, see Spot play, see Jane play, see Dick and Jane on the swing, these kinds of simple things that are read in second grade. But if you look at the primer, it's all redheaded children with very fair skin, blonde children with blue eyes and very fair skin. But you can talk to people of all nationalities in the United States that grew up in the 50s, as I did, and we will have read that book. We, that book was used in second grades. And I thought to myself, my goodness, I could paint them brown and that would be the end of that. So I painted them brown and I painted their hair black and suddenly Dick and Jane became Latin American. It became people of color in the United States. <clears throat> so from there, it just sort of went haywire and I've spent the last 12 years appropriating objects and painting them brown, going from the simple act of buying pricey antiques from postcards to book pages to small sculptures to large sculptures into the Datos Sagrados and the Brown Dot Project, which is where I basically took the brown color and began uh, creating images that depict data. And now I'm into combining the two where I continue to create objects that depict data along with Victorian appropriated objects painted brown to create these object of opulence installations or environments. <clears throat> I'm discovering what the work means as I go along just about every day. Um, I have mirrors that I've created. You can see one of them here. And I actually uh, cover, uh, I actually fill the mirror with a brown mirror. It's actually a brown mirror, which you can't see from here. So if anyone looks into the mirror, they actually appear to be browner or brown. And I had a conversation with a very dear friend of mine, Armando Duron, today, who said that it ba that basically just turned it upside down, so that everyone, whether they like it or not, suddenly could see themselves as a person of color. And uh, so he opened up my eyes to even another way of looking at the work. I'm constantly surprised by it. I'm hoping that it's always growing, but the idea of being able to share my experience as a United States citizen who is also a Mexican American, third generation American, what it means to be brown in the United States has really been an interesting um, journey for me. And some items are, I try to make them as inviting as I can, as interesting as I can, and I try to interject humor because it's a difficult topic to talk about, you know, the politics of color and class uh, very easily lead right into prejudice and racial hatred. And you can't just go, I, I don't, I don't want to go directly to it and just hit the nail on the head. I like the conversation that leads you into the conversation, the dialogue, the image that helps you get there. And a sense of humor helps us open up conversations that otherwise can be very difficult. But they are really important conversations today. And I'm, I'm very, well, of course, I'm pleased and very happy that I live in a country that allows me to speak out loud and to ask questions and to open up. Well, well, we'll get to that. Don't worry. We have plenty of questions about freedom of speech, freedom of expression. But one thing I want to ask you about, um, you know, uh, you've mentioned Chicano culture. And I think that's a term a lot of people have heard before, but they may not be familiar with what Chicano means. Could you tell us a little bit about what Chicano means and what that is um, for those of us? I, you know, I'm one of them. I hear that term and I'm, I, I know it's something, but um, can you explain a little bit about what that is? Well, first I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a caveat. Uh, the question is very similar to you asking me what, it be, what being an American means. And the answer to that question is as varied as the individual that answers it. What does being an American mean to you? Can be answered in a million different ways by a million different people. And I sh I'm sure it is. So to ask what, is, uh, what does it mean to be Chicano or what is, what is Chicanismo? is an open-ended question that can be answered by many people in many different ways. I'll begin with the simplest. Uh, I'll begin with the simplest. Chicano is basically a Mexican-American born in the United States, a Mexican born in the United States as an American. That is what Chicano is. Not all people accept the moniker of Chicano. 
uh, do not accept the moniker of Chicanx or Latinx for that matter of fact. The data proves that, the data proves that. What holds us all together, of course, is uh, the Spanish language, uh, uh, relatives and family that began in Mexico and came here. My family, like many Chicanos in the Southwest, came up through the North, the Norteños, in up through El Paso and into Texas and across the Southwest into California to work because there was so much work out here. The gold rush brought a lot of people, a lot of people. Chicanismo, um, uh, there are a series of uh, iconic um, visual images that are, um, that can be um, uh, said to represent the Chicano uh, culture. One of them being, as we know, uh, Frida Kahlo is everywhere. Uh, much of what Disney has done with Coco and with the, uh, with the, with the movies that have recently uh, centered around Mexican American and Mexican culture have many of these iconic images or emblems, if you will. There are several, um, the, 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 the community of Chicano artists is very large and it's spread pretty widely across the United States. Uh, uh, like I said, Chicago, Denver, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Ooh, quite a lot of Chicano communities. Um, what I enjoy about being a Chicano or a Mexican American is that I have access to um, two languages. I have access to uh, the study of multiple cultures. I very much enjoy studying Mesoamerica. I'm now learning and enjoying studying colonial Mexico. I get to study American Mexican American culture. Uh, the Pew Charitable Trust just found out that um, 80% of all Mexican American women living in the Southwest of the United States, 80% of us have Navajo and Apache blood, which means I also have opportunity to study and become a part of indigenous culture and to study indigenous culture. It's a very, for me, it's a very interesting brew of uh, culture and history uh, that I can tap into for imagery and for pride in myself and my, my family, uh, my ancestors and my community. Um, as I said earlier, you could ask the next Chicano what Chicanismo means to them and they would give you a completely different answer, which is, I think it's indicative of its richness of its, and of its complexity. So if you went into Google and typed in Chicano culture, uh, you would see the emblematic images, but I believe that what you would be missing is that there is a very deep interest and study in Mesoamerican culture, in ancient Mexican culture, and in American indigenous culture, as well as uh, indigenous culture of the Americas. Interesting, yeah. And one thing I find fascinating and, you know, coming from you is, you know, we're talking about these terms and words and you mentioned, oh, you know, what's one thing that's great is I speak two languages and I'm asking, oh, what does Chicano mean? And you said, oh, Latinx, you know, the data bears this out, people feel this way. So you, on one side, you have language, but you as a visual artist, you work in a very different visual language. And, and this is a question that I love asking artists, but what does art, visual arts, convey that words can't, that, that words, sim like why visual arts and not words, I guess, and, and what, what are the advantages of um, the art you make that um, defies language or goes beyond just the words? I do a great deal of reading and I've been reading 20th century writers of America and Europe and now even Russia, and I love words. And I love stories and words uh, can do a great deal. What uh, words, words can capture pictures. Like if you read a story, you can imagine, you begin imagining what the space looks like, what a character might look like, how a character might carry themselves. And in your mind, you begin conjuring images and uh, words help you to, um, if you read enough and you study enough, if you're a student of literature, you begin comparing one writer to another, different styles, different ways of conveying an idea or images or a story or a history or a political concept or a socio-political or socio-cultural concept. Uh, painting kind of comes from the other direction but ends up in the same place. Art does the same thing. You start with the picture first and then the language or the dialogue comes from it. 
Um, so you'll look at one of my images and like I talked about the gentleman who looked at the um, Superman and suddenly the story came out of him. The words came out of him as the dialogue when he looked at the image. So you kind of, they're, they're, they are very, very closely related and writing does have pictures in it and pictures do have words in it and sometimes writing as well. I believe the reason why I use, I would love to have been a writer. I would have loved to have been a screenwriter. I would do anything to have another lifetime to write plays. I would just, uh, I would give anything to have another lifetime to write plays. But I think that as a child, I, well, you know, I just gravitated towards drawing and gravitated towards painting. And that is the skill that I personally developed. As an artist or as a writer, it's very difficult to do much of anything else yeah, because it takes up so much of your brain space, so much of your creative space, spiritual space, logical space, all of these things are taken up. So I've dedicated myself to the image and that's why I am so intent on making sure that people understand that I create the image with the goal of creating dialogue, which is to bring the language into it, to bring the story into it to bring the history into it, to allow people to speak the words. So they kind of go back and forth. And that's been my experience of it. Yeah, and um, one, one, some of your pieces that I found especially poignant were the data stories, uh, especially the, the faces and the portraits. Um, and sorry if I missed this, but where does the inspiration for that come from? You know, um, every artist is different just like Chicano and every American, we're all very different. And uh, the way that we conduct ourselves at the job can be very different. It's a very personal, you know, acumen. It's, it, we're all individuals. That's another great thing about being American. You really get to be an individual. The way that I find imagery is through study and through um, the cross sections or the cross, the crossing of a juxtaposing uh, study. Um, it, People ask me a lot of times, you know, where'd you get that idea? And I'm kind of like, well, I was painting all these objects brown. And I asked myself the question, I wonder what it'd be like if I was a minimalist. I mean, these are such gaudy objects. Why can't I just make very simple objects? Doesn't seem like I can do that very easily. It's not in my DNA. And all I had was a brown, all I could see in my head was a brown circle, a brown circle. And I was studying data on the side. Latinos were uh, doing a lot of talk about the growing population. We're going to be 30% uh, uh, of the population by 2050. Uh, you know, 25% of our population is under 18. Okay, we're just, you know, baby making machine over here. And uh, the, all the day, everyone was talking about the data. And I thought, well, I want to look at the data because I'm not really that happy about just the data, about the population. I want to know about education. I want to know about health. I want to know about workforce data, I want to know um, the gross national pot product for US Latinos is the seventh largest in the world. US Latinos constitute the seventh largest country in the world by gross national product. I mean, people don't know these things. So I had the data on one side and I had the, this brown circle on one side. And one day I walked into the art store, which is where I get most of my ideas. And I saw architectural grid paper. And the two just all of a sudden they just went bing just like that. And in my head, I saw it. And I bought a bunch of architectural grid paper and I came home and I made the first pieces of LA 48.3%. And I can't tell you what the alchemy is that brings my brain together to do this. It's really about, I study literature. I have several different ideas around that. My, in my mind, I might have a half a dozen ideas that I'm working on, but some never come together. Some, uh, there are fragments forever and others, all of a sudden I see it like finding the Dick and Jane primer, all of a sudden, boom, it was just there in front of me. And all of a sudden it just sort of melts together and the idea is created. Uh, the concept is created. Then I have to experiment and, and, and cr to create the idea. I have to experiment a great deal. Sometimes I think the image or the idea is, is cohesive. And then when I go to experiment with it, it just doesn't work out. It's just not clear enough. Uh, the creative process is very, very interesting. Uh, many artists uh, uh, work the same way I do, where they grab in strings, they grab something here, they grab something there, they grab something here, something else influences them, a conversation, an image, an experience, 
uh, uh, you know, just they just grab, you know, uh, from different points, and all of a sudden it, uh, it will just all come together and create a a web, and the image will then appears in my head. It actually appears in my head. I actually see the final object. Yeah, and um, so similar to this, we have a question from the chat. Thank you for asking, um, uh, Susan. What are some of the themes that you have focused on as an as an artist, and how have those themes evolved or stayed the same as your work has developed? Oh, well, uh, to start at the very end, what I'll say is that if you dedicate your life to any topic, any significant portion of your life to a particular topic, to a particular uh, study, eventually the imagery will appear by itself. I've spent the last 50 years pretty much in the Latinx, Chicanx, indigenous communities, reading and studying my experiences like, like Maxwell read in my bio and all of a sudden one day it just came to the door and knocked on it and, sh and showed itself to me. I had enough information that I had gathered that suddenly uh, everything was gonna be brown for a while and that was all there was to it. And when I saw the idea, I basically had to go for it. It was too good to let go. So if you do study something for any great period of time in your life and really make dedications to that, you will find that your writing, uh, your music, your poetry, your art will suddenly begin mirroring this mirroring, this incredible uh, mountain of information that you have gathered. Uh, when I first started out uh, as a young painter in uh, high school, I was actually, I was doing a lot of work up until then as a child, but I was, uh, did some serious work in high school and uh, I was in Europe and I was studying uh, Spanish um, uh, painting. Uh, I, I lived in Madrid, so I got to go to the Prado many, many times and saw some of the great masters, the Spanish masters. I traveled throughout Europe with my parents and was able to visit Italy and France and England and I saw a great deal of Greek and Roman and Renaissance and uh, pre-Christian and early Christian uh, cave paintings, all kinds of things, many kinds of things. And so in that time of my life during like say uh, 15, 14 to say 21, I was mirroring what I was studying. Uh, basically uh, traditional culture, lots of religious imagery. And I actually did my paper and my MFA in Egyptology, the Book of the Dead, because I was interested in ancient cultures and ancient symbology and symbols and signs. When I came to Los Angeles, I found my culture, I found the Mesoamerican culture, and I thought, oh, here's an ancient culture that actually does belong to me, so I think I better study it as well. So I did a great deal of Mexico, I went to many of the sacred sites, I went to many of the, of the major museums and collected books. You know, a serious student of history art, literature, culture, architecture. This is a, the, 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 the grand uh, 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 combination of things that I enjoy the best. So of course, during that time, a lot of my imagery uh, dealt with uh, Mesoamerican uh, symbols and signs. I also found myself, I did a series for 10 years, I did uh, earth sculptures, where I went around Los Angeles and collected old pieces of wood, giant pieces of wood, and made sculpture with them and uh, left, I pulped paper from, from my old prints and made uh, what I called a tree people. I must have made a hundred of those. And those were all based on a relationship with nature, which is indicative of an interest in indigenous cultures. Whether you study Aboriginal culture or whether you study the Native American or the, the Native American of the Western continent, or whether you study even uh, uh, Northern European traditional cultures from the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, you'll find a great deal of interest and connection to nature. Stonehenge is directly related to nature. It's all over the world. You can do Asia, China, and anywhere. You'll find this uh, God was nature for many, many, many years. And so I did, I spent, uh, I spent a decade, um, two decades, dealing with imagery about connection to and relationship to nature. Uh, then I was a mother, and so I did a whole series for about 10 years on a woman, on woman as nature, on woman as, uh, uh, as the goddess. 
and then uh, started painting nature just raw out. I did a lot of uh, what I call uh, fantastic realism uh, nature scenes. And uh, then I blew those out, that, that's a, to catch a phrase, uh, and related nature to psychedelia, a spiritual vision search and uh, pixelated modern technology. And that's where I was actually. I was paint, that's what I was painting were these pixelated uh, blowouts of, uh, they look like, they look like the, the glitches you see on TV uh, mixed with realistic portraiture, oddly enough. And then one day I walked into, I asked a question and I walked into an antique mall. And since 2000, uh, my work has all been about this relationship that I personally have with my own Mexican Americanness, with my own Mexicano ness, with my own Chicano ness. Interesting. Um, I'm excited to ask you this next question because of your background from living overseas and traveling, it seems very broadly. You know, we this is the First Amendment Museum. We're all about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. Um, and art, obviously, as I've, we've mentioned countless times during the speaker series, is you know one of the most powerful forms of speech available to us. What does the how does the free speech culture of the United States impact art in the U.S.? How, is there any relationship between American notions of freedom of speech um, and the visual arts in the U.S.? And feel free to say no. Uh, I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah. I would say in more cases, I would say that it's more related to market. It's more related to uh, market, free market. I think more artists relate their art to the ability to sell whatever they want to make. Right? That they can sell any image that they that they make. And I don't think a lot of artists see it as freedom of speech, because we've had it so long because it literally you know, it lives in our backyard that we, we take it for granted, that we actually have a voice, that we can actually have a message uh, about a particular aspect of American culture or a particular um, attitude or idea that we'd like to share with a very large audience. In the marketplace is where most artists function. I think you're gonna find um, the idea of, uh, I will translate freedom of speech to, um, in, in the Chicano language as I know it, uh, to a freedom to speak about one's culture. And that's become a real catch word in the last year. If you uh, study the Chicano um, art world, you'll find a lot of people who talk about Chicano culture. And so the freedom of speech has really allowed us to talk about who we are, who we'd like to be, who we, how, we, how we remember ourselves and how we see ourselves. Um, I can compare it to uh, living in Spain uh, during Franco's time uh, when uh, you couldn't speak freely in a cafe about anything that was political. People were always shushing you. I can compare it to my travels to Cuba uh, about six years ago where the same thing was very, very apparent that certain things were not spoken of and certain things, many things were painted. They would allow them to paint them, but they wouldn't allow them to leave the country. The images. I went to the Biennale and saw a lot of incredible images of boats. You know, there's no boats in Cuba because they don't want them to get on them and go away. And I was really fascinated by, and really happy that the Biennale included all of these images. These very stark and sometimes rather um, dark images. And I bought the catalog and I was so happy to have the catalog and I brought the catalog home and none of those images were in the catalog and I paid a great deal of money for this very large book. So there's places in the world where you're really not allowed to speak about your experience. You're really not allowed to express what might be considered um, egregious by some people or um, uh, uh, unimportant by some people. And here uh, we're able to say whatever we'd like. Of course, there is social media these days, which allows just about everybody to see you and then not have such kind thoughts about your work. But if you're interested more in the market, then you're gonna produce what sells, the marketplace. You're gonna produce images that sell. 
And that um, is different than producing images that specifically speak about a socio-political or a socio-cultural statement. Some artists are very uh, in tune, uh, in environmental artists, artists who speak about you know, um, different issues that we're facing in the United States and are being faced around the world. But as I said before, I do it with a sense of humor so that we can talk about it. That's my purpose of, for the work. I'm not, I am interested, of course, in selling my work and being a part of major collections, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the reasoning for my work. I really want to talk about and share the good news and share, you know, share the reality of what it means to be a person of color in the United States. Do, do you this ever, a, oh, sorry. Do you ever feel the tension of, oh, there's a piece of art I want to make, but I don't know if the market likes it, or I don't know if this will sell, so I, I better not make it. Do you ever feel that tension, or are you always one way or the other? I don't think that way. I really don't think that way. That's why I made the difference. I don't, I create the object. I create the object. And I have uh, several different, I have a, you know, I have a series of images right now that have never gone anywhere that are basically about the, the Catholic Church and all, all the pedophile cases. And that's definitely wouldn't be very popular in the market. <laughs> but they're very, I mean, they're, they're very poignant works and they're very difficult works, but they're also very beautiful. They're extremely beautiful to look at until you begin the conversation. For me, art isn't, I, you know, I teach. I, I lecture, I coach, uh, and, and so I have, uh, I've never had a full-time job, but I've always had a way to make a living. And I, uh, so that my art could be free of any constraints, uh, be, be free of the constraints of the market. I don't need to sell in order to live. I don't need to sell in order to live the life that I choose to live. So my art is really my personal voice. It belongs to me. It is dear to me. It means everything to me to allow my creative mind, my intellectual mind, my creative mind to function and come up with ideas and concepts and a vision that is truly me. You know, back to the idea of being an individual in the United States. I mean, what else could it possibly be but our voice that would make us an individual in the United States? And to be able to speak it freely is certainly one of the greatest gifts that I can imagine having as an artist because it doesn't clog up the idea. The idea can go anywhere at any time and it allows your mind a total freedom to create something that is really true to who you are as an individual. Yeah, so we have a couple uh, questions in the chat. So um, you mentioned going back to the art you have about the Catholic Church. So obviously the Catholic Church is a big deal in uh, the Hispanic Chicano community. I mean, that if you've traveled, anybody who's traveled to Southwest knows that this is a big deal. Um, has, is, has your art received, has that art in particular received any pushback uh, because of how, I guess, tense and how wrapped up in feelings that whole issue is? Well, I don't think I could show it in the Latin American. Um, I've never created, a, I have a large body of it, but it's in a drawer and it's in boxes uh, because my community is, I, don't, I think it's 55% of all Latinos in the United States are Catholic. There, there you go for some data off the top of my head. That's good, that's impressive. And yeah, and I think that I would say probably 85% uh, are, are Christian, including the Catholics. And the last 15% are either agnostic or indigenous like me. I'm not a Christian. I haven't been a Christian since I was 15 years old. I um, just couldn't really handle the idea that uh, the Aborigines of, of Australia, the, the people of the Congo, uh, the Native American people were not allowed into paradise because God had a different kind of face. Because God's face was different. I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it, so I had to go. And uh, that's what brought me into the indigenous communities. So I have no difficulty talking about the Catholic Church um, uh, now that I'm doing all this research about uh, uh, the history of the Catholic Church, uh, the history of the corporation of the Catholic Church, um, uh, you know, the uh, colonialism, patriarchy, all the big words, all the big words that are coming out now, 
it's not hard for me to imagine an object that basically brings, uh, brings the conversation to light. Let's just bring the conversation to light and talk about this. I have some uh, well-educated and well-informed individuals that understand that I have my point of view and uh, that they don't agree with my point of view, but that they do agree that the objects are beautiful, that they're very well-constructed and very informative. Um, I'm still collecting objects to appropriate and to make this statement. But yes, I don't think it would ever be able to be shown in, to, in, in a Latin American center that was anywhere near a Catholic church. Um, do you think they, uh, why do you, why do you say that? Why do you think you, you would, it wouldn't be able to I think to it would insult it? people. I think people would be insulted. I think people would be angry and insulted because faith is, faith is faith. And there's not a lot you can do to move it. You know, faith is faith. Uh, and I wouldn't want to insult my community. I wouldn't want to insult them, but I have had other opportunities in other lo locales that are more high, uh, what, maybe high-ended uh, in regards to thought process, where art is really about thought process and dialogue and encounters and the mixing of cultures or the, the communication between multiple points of view, where you actually have a philosophical, a philosophical attitude, which would allow me to show the works. Um, and so how do you think we should deal with art that we find insulting? Or, um, or what do you think about artists who make art that is meant to be inflammatory or insulting or offensive. This is a conversation we have with freedom of speech and a civility in the United States is what's the line of insulting and should you insult people? What is the place for offensive speech? What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a, it's a tough question, really. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, uh, that's why we have so many conversations about the it. Line is, the line is not only thin, it's, it's practically indivisible. Um, and uh, because people can choose, people choose in all different directions. And uh, because people can choose, they can choose what they like to look at. Because people can choose, they can choose what they find offensive and what they find not offensive. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the cutting edge of uh, freedom of speech. And I think the answer for me would be that we all have to respect each other's choices that we have to respect each other's way of looking at things. If we disagree with something, don't buy it. Don't buy it. Don't watch it. Don't listen to it. Don't emulate it. Uh, you know, like make, uh, if you're gonna make a choice, make a strong choice. But I don't think that we could possibly even begin to regulate offensive images in any way that really would make uh, an impact. There are many images that I find uh, you know, not so much offensive as just sort of disgusting, <laughs> you know? And so I just don't go there. And I think that freedom of speech allows us to make those choices, to make, I, I, would, I would say make informed choices, but you can't regulate that either. You know, study, study the reason why you're attracted to this particular disgusting image. You know, what are they finding that um, young women are being egregiously offended by images on uh, social media to the point where they uh, feel very negatively about themselves? I wouldn't be surprised if suicide rates aren't up. But somehow or another, they're attracted to these images that uh, appear beautiful, but they're actually very harmful. What do you do about that? Um, you know, I think parents have to take responsibility to educate their kids about choice. What does choice mean? You know, if something is harmful to you and you feel bad when you look at it, then let's not look at that anymore. Let's go over here and look at this. Um, I don't think popular culture is really, uh, really thinks about choice. I don't think, I think popular culture is more addicted to what sells than anything else. And they're very trend oriented. So if something's popular and sells a lot, then they want one too, even if it's bad for them. Um, it's a very, it's not even a line. I wouldn't even call it a line. It's like this invisible wiggly worm that kind of moves through um, trend, trend. And I'm not a big fan of trend, as you can tell. I don't follow the Chicano trend. I don't follow the art market trends. I think you can see that. I follow my, my own study. 
um, my own investigation, uh, my own experimentation around specific topics, um, which, I, uh, which I take very seriously and study very seriously. I like to consider myself a philosopher poet. I enjoy study a great deal. And I think that's different than uh, many Americans who take choice kind of lightly and allow other people to choose for them rather than choosing for themselves based on information, knowledge, and self-knowledge. Yeah, if we had all night, I would love to go through all of that because there's have so many questions. And it's fascinating to hear um, your perspective. I, I love these questions because they do bring up these sort of, again, it's a wiggly worm and trying to figure out the anatomy of this wiggly worm is, uh, you know, if you're into philosophy, it's an interesting philosophical conversation. But, um, you know, in the interest of time, I'll finish with one question we have from our chat. Uh, again, thank you, Susan. Uh, how can your pieces stimulate dialogue among the folks who do not go to museums or consider themselves consumers of art? And yeah, this well, is great you. for us because we run a museum and we want to know how we can reach people who don't go to museums. Thank God for social media in this particular thing. I wouldn't say thank God for social media for much of anything else, but at least we get to share uh, imagery. And sometimes the imagery is interesting and provocative and, and engages uh, conversation. Uh, when I post across social media, I get lots of really nice conversations. When I am uh, invited to speak, such as from the museum about these issues, I get to talk to people like, yourself and Maxwell and all of the people who are joining us this evening and will see the podcast, they'll begin thinking about these questions and ask themselves these questions as well. Uh, when I was at the uh, La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, I think 40,000 people saw my show. Um, they were clocking it by the day of how many visitors they got into the galleries. And you'd be surprised how many people actually go to community centers, cultural centers, museum special days, museum family days, how many people, uh, visitors to Los Angeles come to see galleries. There's many areas where galleries are available for view. There's also publication. I, I have a beautiful publication of my work that is available on PDF. If you go to my website, lindavallejo.com, you'll see my archives. And there's a lot of information there about Chicano art all over the nation for the last 50 years. Exhibitions that I've been included in with other artists as well. Thank goodness for the internet and the web and for social media in this very within this very small bubble of good news, right? This 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 small but compact bubble of good news where we can share with each other and uh, begin a dialogue. Um, video, you know, there's lots of video out there. There's many things that can be done, and I'm always I, I always welcome the opportunity to speak about the work. I always welcome the opportunity to answer questions and to investigate what this all means to all of us. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and again, thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, if you missed any of this, or if you want to share this talk, it'll be available on our website at firstamendmentmuseum.org. Um, it should be up sometime tomorrow or the day after. Um, and again, Linda, thank you so much for everything. This was a fascinating conversation, a, a thoughtful conversation, and I want to Thank you again for taking the time to join us today. Well, I wanna thank the museum, of course, for inviting me and thank, thank the viewers and yourself and Kristen for the wonderful questions. I learned a lot this evening myself about my feelings about the work and my feelings about free speech. I'm very grateful for it. I'm sure somehow or another it'll find its way into the work. And I just wanna give a little apology for the slow beginning and my PowerPoint presentation, but I hope that you enjoyed seeing the images and I hope that you all will follow each other and continue this really great conversation about how important it is to value our free speech in this country. Awesome. Thank you so much, Linda. Have a good night, everyone. My pleasure. Thank you.